Hi, my name is Daniel Carell, and I'm a sophomore computer science student at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm Abigail Trong. I am also a second year computer science student at the University of Texas at Austin. And we are presenting our work, um, Benchmarking Metric Ground Navigation, in collaboration with Shui Su Xiao and Peter Stone, who are also at the University of Texas at Austin. As this is a conference on search and rescue robotics, you may be interested in developing better navigation systems for robots to handle a wide variety of environments. So if you develop a new navigation system, how do you show that it is better than existing navigation systems? A common solution is to just cherry pick a few difficult environments and evaluate the planner in those environments. But that doesn't really tell us that your system can handle difficult environments in general. So this brings us to our central questions. First, what makes an environment difficult? Second, how do we quantify that difficulty? And building on these, how can we objectively evaluate motion planners and compare them? So in our work, we present a benchmark data set of 300 test environments for metric ground navigation. For each of these 300 environments, we give a baseline difficulty level based on the time it takes to traverse each of them using two standard motion planners. We propose a set of features that can quantify different aspects of difficulty. Using these features and the baseline difficulty level, we then use a function approximator to fit difficulty levels to the features. This gives us a way to assess the difficulty of new environments. We also propose a method of generating environments within a range of difficulty levels. Here we have an example of an easy environment, some medium environments, and a hard environment. We quantify those difficulty levels using the time it takes two standard planners to traverse them, and we divide the traversal times by the length of each path so that they are compared based on difficulty and not path length. I want to note that some navigation environments in this data set are beyond the capabilities of some commonly used planners. For example, about 80% of our trials in this environment failed to reach the goal. However, environments such as this are still relevant because they may be similar to the highly cluttered environments encountered in search and rescue robotics. Here we have an example of using the barn data set. The colored dots represent the traversal times of five different motion planners uh, across all 300 environments. The straight lines are fitted to those dots. With this graph, we can objectively compare the performance of these five motion planners. For example, we clearly see that some planners are more consistent than others, and some planners are sensitive to increased difficulty level. Using the features we provide, you can also analyze your planner and see which types of environments cause your planner to fail. Test pits are designed to quantify performance based on predefined metrics. Of the existing test beds, some are tailored to demonstrate a newly developed feature. Other test beds test other capabilities, such as the ability to determine where to navigate while assuming that the robot already knows how to navigate. The proposed testbed is developed to benchmark 2D metric ground navigation. This test, this data set can also be easily instantiated as a physical testbed. Part of the work in benchmarking navigation systems is being able to quantify the difficulty of the navigation environment. A commonly used metric to quantify difficulty is the distance to the closest obstacle. However, few works consider more than a single source of difficulty. Robot motion risk is also related to the difficulty of a navigation environment. In our work, we present metrics inspired by the risk universe to quantify the difficulty level and use a data-driven approach to combine these metrics instead of manually assigning weights to each. In this work, we also present five metrics or features to quantify the difficulty level of the navigation environments. The purpose of these features is to allow us to predict the difficulty level of unseen environments. All metrics are calculated in the robot's configuration space. The first metric is the distance to the closest obstacle. For each cell, the distance to the closest obstacle is the distance from the robot's cell to the nearest occupied cell. In these examples, the robot is represented by a blue square and obstacles are represented by black squares. 
The next metric is average visibility. The average visibility is the average distance from the cell to an obstacle along each ray in a 360 degree scan. For our work, we compute the average visibility with eight rays. In this example, the robot on the right has higher average visibility than the one on the left because the rays are longer on average. Um, dispersion contributes to difficulty because more dispersed obstacles provide more ways in and out of a space and often results in tighter gaps. So here we can see that even though the number of filled cells is the same for configuration one as configuration two, configuration two would be more difficult to navigate because the obstacles are more scattered. Concretely, we calculate dispersion using 16 rays with a maximum length of three. Going around in our scan on the left, we encounter one change, two, three, and four total changes in our scan, resulting in a dispersion count of four. In the second example, the obstacles are more dispersed, resulting in a higher dispersion count of eight. The characteristic dimension metric measures the tightness of a space and is computed along eight axes. This metric is similar to average visibility, but we only consider the axis with the minimum visibility. So in this example, the robot on the right is in a tighter space than the one on the left, even though they are the same distance from the closest obstacle. On the left, we have the four pairs of axes, so vertical, horizontal, two diagonals, and the horizontal axis has the lowest visibility. This results in a characteristic dimension of two. And on the right, the horizontal axis is still the axis with the lowest visibility. But this time, the robot can only move one cell in that right direction. Tortuosity measures the twistiness of a path and is calculated using the arc chord ratio. Here, the start and end points of the path are shown in green. Using the arc chord ratio, we get a tortuosity value of one for a straight path. And this is a twistier path. So using the arc chord ratio, we get a higher tortuosity value of 2.5. To see how these metrics contribute to the combined difficulty level, we measure the baseline difficulty of each environment using 3000 simulation trials. Then we use a function approximator to map the metrics to the difficulty level. To generate our data set, we chose these parameters to create more varied and realistic navigation environments and repeated each set of parameters 25 times, giving us a total of 300. Our approach involves two main parts. First, environment generation using cellular automaton and the five difficulty metrics and the function approximator. To generate navigation environments, we use a technique called cellular automaton. We choose this technique because it's systematic and customizable due to its four parameters the initial fill percent, the number of smoothing iterations, and the two thresholds. So we can tune these parameters to create worlds with a wide range of various difficulties. And we can also use these to create worlds that are more realistic and representative than if we were to create them by hand. And so you can see on the screen, using Cellular Automaton, we've generated three environments that span the range from easy to hard. And so this makes it really good for our data set because we can ensure that the environments span the range from very easy to very hard so that we get a true objective representation of real world environments. So we start with a grid of empty or white cells and then randomly fill them according to the initial fill percent parameter. So here's an example of an initially filled grid with a fill percent of 35. Thereafter, this initially filled grid undergoes a series of smoothing iterations in which the state of the cell in the next iteration depends on the state of its neighbors in the current iteration. And so the grid morphs and smooths out to create more realistic obstacles and removes some of the more jagged and obtuse edges. And so there are two main parameters that go along with this stage, the fill threshold and clear threshold. The fill threshold states that if a cell has at least this many filled neighbors, it will be filled in the next iteration. And the converse, the clear threshold, states that if a cell has this many or fewer filled neighbors, it will be cleared in the next iteration. And so the higher that we make these thresholds, the more sparse that the map will be, so we can adapt it to fit whatever we need for the navigation environments. So for the purposes of our data set, we used one for the clear threshold and five for the th fill threshold because those gave the best spectrum of results. And we chose to vary the initial fill percent and the number of smoothing iterations instead. And here you can see an example of what it would look like with these parameters. So after the initial fill, you can see the square in the middle is initially filled, but it has zero filled neighbors, which is less than the clear threshold of one. 
So in the next state, it is cleared. And then here's an example of the converse in which the cell is initially cleared in the initial fill. And then after the first iteration, it is filled. So as you can see, uh, after the initial fill, it has five filled neighbors, which includes the diagonals, which is greater than or equal to the fill threshold of five. So in the next state, the cell is filled. And it's important to note that all of the updates within an iteration happen in parallel rather than in sequence. So we use the original map from the iteration before for all of the updates. So you can see that as the smoothing iterations go on, some of the more jagged edges and the outliers begin to smooth out. And so it creates more realistic obstacles for the environment. And so once we've actually generated the environments using cellular automaton, we then plan a path through these environments to provide the coordinates for simulation trials. And so first we convert the obstacle space into the robot's configuration space using the robot's footprint. And so this makes the map footprint agnostic, which means it can fit robots of any size. And so this allows us to maintain the map characteristics that we desire, while also making it usable for robots of any size that is desired. And so in this robot configuration space, we use a flood fill algorithm first to determine whether or not a path is possible. And then we use an ASTAR algorithm to actually plan the path through the environment, taking into account things like the robot's turn radius. And so once we have the navigation environments and the five difficulty metrics we wanna use as input for the difficulty function, we then run simulation trials to benchmark the difficulty of all of the navigation environments. So for these simulations, we, for the robot, we use a clear path jackal robot, which is in the picture on the right. It's a four wheel differential drive non-holonomic robot. And we use two different planners to be representative of two main groups of planners. First, we use a dynamic window approach or DWA, which is broadly representative of sampling based planners and the elastic band or E-band, which is broadly representative of optimization based planners. And so for each of the 300 environments, we run five trials for each of the planners to benchmark how long it takes for the robot to navigate the environment using that planner. And then we normalize the time it takes by the path length to get the normalized traversal time for each of the environments. So then to learn a difficulty function, we use a neural network with two fully connected layers. The input is the five difficulty metrics that we computed earlier, which have been averaged over the entire path for each of the environments. And then the output is the difficulty, which is the traversal time from the simulation trials normalized by the path length. After running the 3000 experiments in simulation, we use physical experiments to ensure that our simulation trials are actually representative of the real world. So we use the same robot, the clear path jackal, and the same parameters as we used in simulation. We generated five new navigation environments using cellular automaton and instantiated them using cardboard boxes. So here are the five environments that we generated, and there is the clear path jackal running the trials through these physical experiments. And so our difficulty function approximator achieves the following results. So for each of the 300 navigation environments, we take the five DWA trials and the five event trials and average them together to get the combined difficulty level. We then sort all of the navigation environments by their combined difficulty level, which gives us the graph that you see on the right. The blue line represents the combined difficulty level in normalized average traversal time, and the light blue represents the standard deviation away from this combined difficulty level. And so as you can see, the purple line, which represents our predicted difficulty from our function approximator is very closely correlated with that of the actual combined difficulty, which means our function approximator and the five difficulty metrics are quite good at predicting difficulty. Another thing to note is that the graph in the green on the left has a steeper slope than that of E-band, which is seen in the red, which means that the DWA planner is more sensitive to increases in difficulty than the E-band planner is. Then to validate our function approximator in the physical trials, we get the following results. As you can see, the predicted difficulty and the actual difficulty in normalized average traversal time are still very closely correlated. And again, you can see that the slope of the red line, which is E-band, is less steep than that of DWA, which is in green, which again shows that the DWA is more sensitive to the increased difficulty, something we also observed in simulation. So in conclusion, we present a data set of 300 navigation environments that represent a wide array of various difficulty levels. This data set can be used for a number of purposes. First, it can be used to benchmark metric ground navigation, which allows for truly objective comparison of various planners. The data set can also be used as a curriculum or a cost function for learning based planners. We also present our five difficulty metrics to characterize environments and a function approximator that combines them to predict the environment difficulty. We also present our method of generating environments that create a wide array of difficulty levels. All of the data set and the open source code are available at the link you see on the screen. We thank you for your time and we hope you find this information useful.